right, so we're just getting at five past now, so we might get started. So I would like to start by acknowledging um, the traditional owners. So um, from the University of Sydney, we acknowledge the tradition of custodianship and law of the country on which the University of Sydney campuses stand. Um, we pay our respects to those who have cared and continue to care for country. Um, and after that, I would like to welcome uh, Jasmine Optum, who is from um, the Redfern Legal Center Financial Abuse Service. So Jasmine is a specialist credit, debt and consumer lawyer in the Community Legal Center. She leads the Financial Abuse Service at Redfern Legal Center, which is a statewide service which gives specialist legal advice to victims um, and survivors of financial abuse in New South Wales. Uh, Jasmine also coordinates the New South Wales chapter of the Economic Abuse Reference Group, which is a network of community organisations which influence government and industry responses to the financial impact of domestic violence. So I'd like to thank Jasmine for volunteering to um, talk to us all this morning. Um, just a few ground um, groundkeeping rules. So um, first of all, this will be recorded. Um, so if you want to share it with colleagues um, after the fact, uh, feel free to do so. Um, we do have a chat function. So if you want to send a question in the Q&A box that's down on the bottom of your screen, um, please write a question in there. Um, we'll probably answer the question. So Jasmine's going to give a presentation on financial abuse and legal aspects of financial abuse. And then We'll have a bit of a discussion with her and some of that can be guided by the questions that that you ask as attendees so please put those questions in the box and we'll do our best to answer them this morning all right jasmine um welcome again and yeah would you like to get started thanks so much chris um thanks for having me everyone i'll try and share my screen and hopefully this will go without a hitch can everyone see that Hopefully. Perfect. Okay, so I'll just start off by also acknowledging that I am on um, Aboriginal land today um, on Gadigal country in central Sydney, um, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also recognise the disproportionate um, impact that domestic violence um, and responses to domestic violence often have in First Nations communities. I wanted to keep that front and, and centre of mind today. So a quick outline of what I'm hoping to get through and then open up for a bit more of a discussion. Um, I'm sure many of you will be very familiar with financial abuse and the way that that can present, but I wanted to run through some examples, um, a bit of an explanation about what our service does, and then the legal pathways that we use um, to try and address um, some of the financial abuse issues that we see in our casework, um, as well as some of our work in law reform and then some further resources you can find. Um, so if uh, there's any interest in um, some of the kind of legal pathways and avenues that I'm talking about, you can find a lot of resources on our website. Um, the link is at the bottom of the screen there and I'm happy to share these slides as well. Um, so you can find previous free recordings of webinars and training we've done as well as um, all of the resources and guidelines that I'll be talking about today. A uh, quick disclaimer that as we are um, a legal centre in Sydney and our service is a New South Wales based service, um, I will be talking about the law as it stands in New South Wales. Um, a lot of the work that we do relates to federal legislation, um, but just a quick disclaimer, this is not legal advice um, and to refer anyone you're assisting um, to seek legal advice. So what is financial abuse? Um, at its root cause, it's a form of domestic violence where the perpetrator uses money and, and access to money, finances, economic resources um, as a means to gain power and control their partner. Um, you might have heard the terms financial abuse and economic abuse being used interchangeably. Um, economic abuse is generally considered slightly broader in that it can relate to um, economic resources like the ability to study or work um, or gain um, meaningful employment. Um, there's actually no single agreed legal definition of domestic violence in Australia. Um, we haven't quite harmonised all of our legislation in that respect, um, but that definition up on the screen is um, one from 1-800-RESPECT. I just wanted to give a disclaimer um, up front about the use of gendered language. Um, statistically, we know that men are more likely to be perpetrators of financial abuse and other forms of, of family violence. 
and that women are more likely to be victim survivors. Um, but it's certainly not always the case. Our service is not um, gendered in that we do assist male victim survivors um, of female perpetrators. We assist victim survivors in same sex relationships. Um, and it's not always the case that the person who gambles is actually the person perpetrating financial abuse. So these are some common behaviours of financial abuse um, that have been identified in um, some of the growing literature in this space. Um, the one I wanted to call out is under um, item two there, which is denying the accumulation of personal assets or eroding those assets, um, which is where we often see um, incidences of gambling. Um, but gambling can be a factor in all of these circumstances and a, a driving force behind a lot of these behaviours. Um, and it's often present in the matters we assist with where sums have been withdrawn from a joint account or credit cards have been used to fund gambling expenses. Um, so again, a couple of the issues that we see come through our service um, is a refusal to contribute to joint debts or pay child support. Um, similarly, on the flip side, there might be a refusal to have any debts in the perpetrator's name, and they might all be um, in the victim survivor's name and impacting the victim survivor's creditworthiness. Um, withdrawing money from a joint bank account or cutting off access, um, transferring property into someone else's name to avoid that property then being considered a joint asset for the purposes of family law proceedings. Uh, coercion to sign documents, um, sign personal guarantees for business debts, make false declarations, particularly to Centrelink, for example, or false um, uh, tax um, returns and statements. Um, we see identity theft increasingly in the kind of post-pandemic world where so many transactions are happening exclusively online, um, particularly in the space of buy now, pay later accounts, um, wage advance accounts, and those sort of fringe credit products. Um, and also perpetrators just taking control of finances and assets, um, something we saw a lot of in the early um, period of the COVID lockdowns was um, perpetrators accessing the victim survivors superannuation and making early withdrawals um, under that kind of government exemption. Um, so we see gambling kind of intersect with all of these behaviours and all of these issues, um, but the nature of financial abuse and the withholding of financial information means that our clients are often left to guess or make assumptions about their partner's gambling habits. Um, and the nature and extent of any gambling might not actually become apparent unless the victim survivor pursues a property settlement in family law and gets to the exchange of um, financial disclosure, or if we obtain bank statements and can then identify patterns of gambling on credit card statements or joint accounts. Um, I just wanted to highlight um, a couple of quotes from the um, Norley King article that I, I think Chris might have shared um, around the sort of sequencing of gambling behaviours in financial abuse, um, in that there's this initial sort of depletion of savings and um, increasing debt and then targeting joint bank accounts, um, often uh, making withdrawals from offset accounts of home loans or even refinancing home loans to access more equity in the property and then use that equity um, for gambling and, and other um, expenses. Um, and there's some good examples on the screen there. Um, particularly the gambling family resources away post separation is very relevant in the context of family law proceedings and how that might be dealt with. In terms of the prevalence of financial abuse, um, these stats are fairly old now, but we don't have a lot of reliable data about the prevalence in Australia, and we know that it is underreported. Um, so we've got there a fairly high proportion of Australians experiencing um, financial abuse and that gendered division that I mentioned earlier. Um, some Deloitte research from 2022 um, highlighted that financial abuse is um, prevalent in almost every case of, of domestic violence, or at least people seeking help um, for domestic violence. Um, and we've got those stats around 43 female victim survivors and 27 male victim survivors every hour of 2020. 
um, which are fairly staggering statistics. Um, and that research also highlighted the cost of financial abuse, both to the economy in terms of um, mental health costs, lost productivity, dead weight losses, um, but also uh, really importantly, the cost to collective victim survivors across Australia um, of $5.7 billion per year. So a, a quick overview of um, our centre and, and how we came to do this work. Um, Redfern Legal Centre was the uh, first community legal centre in Australia, the second, sorry, first in New South Wales, the second in Australia. Um, and we opened back in 1977, I believe. Um, we've grown obviously over the time since then, and we now have a range of um, services, both catering to our local sort of catchment area and in inner city Sydney, um, and then a number of statewide services. So those statewide services include the financial abuse service, um, our international students legal service, our police accountability practice, um, which has had a lot of airtime in the news recently in relation to um, COVID fines um, and also our migrant employment legal service. So our service launched back in 2019 um, and was born out of um, a recognition that there were increasingly clients coming through our doors who had debts and other financial issues stemming from their experience of um, domestic violence and financial abuse. Um, and recognising that that wasn't just a local issue, that it was actually statewide and that there was a lack of specialist support available for people. So the way our <clears throat> service operates is with a legal service, which um, provides assistance statewide, as I mentioned, um, and then a second arm of our service, which focuses on using the evidence base from our casework and from our clients to then inform our um, policy and law reform work um, to try to achieve systemic change. We also provide a lot of training and resources for community workers um, to try and, uh, I guess, build the capacity of um, the community sector, but also the financial services sector to identify and better address financial abuse. So we mostly assist clients um, over the phone these days because um, they might be located anywhere from Bega to Byron Bay to Burke, um, but we do offer Zoom and face-to-face -face appointments as well. Um, we do represent clients in um, eligible cases and our service is not um, means tested in any way um, for initial advice. Um, the reason for that is that we have assisted many clients who had assets and income on paper um, that would have excluded them from many services, um, but that didn't actually reflect their access to financial resources um, because of the financial abuse. Um, our lawyers are trauma informed. We understand the safety risks. We keep that front and center in the clients that we work with. Um, and we also are able to provide um, referrals for non-legal support across New South Wales. We advise on a fairly broad area, um, areas of law, anywhere from you know, consumer credit and consumer law through to bankruptcy, financial hardship, um, company law, um, including where um, clients have been made dummy directors of companies controlled by the perpetrator of financial abuse, um, which is actually excluded from many free legal services. Um, legal aid won't advise on company matters and neither will most community legal centres. Um, and family law is obviously a very big part of our practice, um, as is um, sort of state-based things like fines um, incurred by a perpetrator of financial abuse, but in the victim survivor's name. Um, a, a large part of our service is the fact that we bring together um, lawyers with different areas of expertise. Um, so we will triage clients at intake um, and depending on their needs and their legal matter, we'll either offer them an appointment with a credit and debt specialist or a family law specialist or both um, in what we call a co-advice, which allows the lawyers to sort of assess together whether the client is, um, you know, has pathways available to them in family law, in credit and debt law, uh, law or debt recovery, and which pathway might be um, more suitable for that client so that they're not sort of doing things in isolation and having to go to different places to get advice from different lawyers and then kind of make a decision themselves. 
So some of the pathways that are available in credit debt and consumer law um, are, I, I guess, the, the primary means where we can try to resolve some of the actual financial liabilities um, that victim survivors are often left with through um, the financial abuse they've experienced and often as a result of um, either their use of gambling or their ex-partner's use of gambling. Um, and there is no such thing as financial abuse law. Um, so I guess that's the first thing to say is that we have to use a whole range of um, legal tools at our disposal to try and achieve outcomes for clients. Um, so just to give you an overview of the sorts of debt we might be looking at um, anywhere from your typical sort of consumer credit debts, business debts, telcos, utilities, um, and then those fines, council rates that I mentioned. Um, we always like to remind um, anyone who might be working with victim survivors that if you become aware of any of these um, kind of urgent legal issues that you should be referring the client for legal advice as soon as possible, um, particularly <clears throat> if court proceedings have already been commenced um, or if the client has been served with a statement of claim, they will likely only have 28 days to lodge a defence um, before default judgment can be ordered against them. Um, if the victim survivor has had their bank account or their wages garnished, um, if they've got a default notice um, on a loan secured by property, there's a risk of that properties, whether that's a house or a car, um, being seized. Or if the victim survivor's savings or assets <clears throat> are being eroded quickly, and that's often the case um, where we see gambling being used um, either during or, or after a relationship. So the sorts of complaints we are often making on behalf of our clients um, against financial institutions, for example, who have um, provided lines of credit are that the client was coerced into signing a credit contract, um, their signature was forged, they got no benefit from the credit, um, particularly where there's car loans, um, and it's very obvious that the partner, perhaps as a result of their use of gambling, um, had a credit score that was too low to actually get credit in their own name, um, or the client didn't understand the terms of the contract or couldn't afford it at the time it was approved. So these are all sort of complaints against the financial institution. Um, so often we're helping clients apply for financial hardship assistance. That might be a waiver or a payment plan, making consumer complaints um, on the basis that the institution breached their um, legal obligations under our credit laws. Um, or breached industry guidelines and codes of practice. We very often have to take matters to external dispute resolution schemes. Um, there are systems for requesting fines to be withdrawn or waived, um, and we're often advising on debt recovery proceedings, and that might be um, a client who's being pursued for a debt, or it might be our client pursuing their ex-partner for a debt. Um, and these are just some examples of the outcomes that we um, will often achieve for clients in, in resolving some of these kind of financial hangovers, I guess, from um, uh, financially abusive relationships or coerced debt. Um, and that um, section around credit reporting becomes particularly important when you're looking at someone's long-term financial independence and their kind of credit worthiness um, and their ability to sort of recover and move forward. Um, I wanted to quickly run through some of the pathways in family law. Um, in full disclosure, I'm not a family lawyer. We do have family lawyers in our team, um, but this is um, a really important consideration um, and it's important to be aware of when someone might benefit from um, getting family law advice. The bad news is that um, financial abuse and economic abuse are not particularly well um, addressed in family law. Um, these definitions, um, which are sort of the best we've got. So unreasonably denying someone financial autonomy or unreasonably withholding financial support um, were only added to the Family Law Act in 2012. So we've only had them in there for about a decade. Um, and family law provides pretty limited assistance to people who have suffered financially due to family violence or financial abuse or gambling, um, for example. Um, so there are no, there's no specific requirement for financial abuse to be considered when a property settlement, so, you know, a financial settlement after the end of a relationship, um, when that's being considered. Um, 
often the evidence in family court matters doesn't really consider how debts arose. It just considers whether there are debts. And if they're joint debts, then they're joint debts and they'll be on the balance sheet. Um, and generally there's an argument or an assumption that any debts were for the benefit of the family um, unless the debts were accumulated due to gambling um, or after separation. Um, the problem now is that where a sum of money from the kind of joint assets of the couple has been lost due to gambling, it's just considered lost and there's no way of getting that money back. And so it can be very difficult um, to argue for that to be taken into account and to sort of compensate the person who wasn't gambling um, because of the gambling person's behaviour. Um, and again, there are many tactics of financial abuse um, that aren't particularly well understood by the courts. Um, so just in case this is of interest to anyone, um, I've got a couple of um, decisions up there on the screen. So we've got this um, principle from the 1980s that um, financial losses in a relationship should be shared um, unless one person has sort of embarked on this course of conduct to reduce or minimise the value of the assets um, or acted recklessly with those assets. Um, <clears throat> our kind of, uh, I guess, cornerstone case, um, Kennan from the 90s, um, was helpful in establishing that where there was domestic violence and that made the victim's contributions to the relationship more arduous, um, that that can be taken into account in a financial settlement, um, but it's a very difficult threshold to reach and there is a very big focus on physical domestic violence rather than financial abuse. Um, and then a couple of more recent examples where some behaviours um, were held not to constitute financial abuse, including um, a husband borrowing money from a wife against her credit card to use for gambling and, and leaving this debt at the end of the day. Um, a, a quick um, mention of joint accounts because that's where we often see funds being kind of siphoned off to use for gambling. Um, generally, our advice will be to always notify the bank in writing of a separation if the couple have joint accounts and joint redraw facilities. Um, might be necessary to um, see whether the person has actually um, appointed a power of attorney um, and then revoke that if that's the, their ex-partner or the person using gambling. Um, and then from a family law perspective, consider how any of those losses will be dealt with during the negotiations or how um, any of those gambling losses will be actually um, dealt with. So some of the family law um, outcomes, I guess, that, that we're often working to achieve for clients um, are you know, dividing assets and debts in that property settlement, um, spousal maintenance orders, um, if one party has future financial needs, child support is obviously um, a very big part of this puzzle. Um, and there can also be orders to allow the victim survivor to stay um, in the family home by themselves until it's sold or dealt with, um, or set aside property orders if they were um, inappropriate in some way. So I just wanted to give a, a brief case study of um, a client that we've had come through our service um, where gambling was a very big um, part of, of her personal situation. And I think it really highlights some of the opportunities for reform that um, were mentioned in the Nerali King article and that others in the sector have been talking about for a little while, because I think it really brings that to light. <clears throat> So um, let's call this client Nita. Obviously, her name has been changed for privacy reasons. Um, she lives in regional New South Wales. Her husband was the primary sort of breadwinner and tech, took care of the finances um, while she was raising their children. Um, he actually passed away fairly recently after a terminal illness, um, which he was aware of um, and, and battled for a couple of years before his passing. Um, he had told her that he had paid down their joint debts um, and was close to discharging the mortgage on their family home and that she would be left um, in a fairly secure financial position. Um, but after his passing, she discovered that um, she actually still had a very significant debt, which was now just hers to pay, um, that he had actually refinanced um, their mortgage in order to access additional equity 
So rather than actually paying the debt down, he had increased the debt um, and she was left in a very precarious financial position. Um, he had also destroyed a whole lot of financial documents and records, which made it really difficult to um, investigate what had happened. Um, so once Nita was connected with a financial counsellor, she discovered that he had gambled close to a million dollars um, that he had withdrawn from the mortgage offset account and through refinancing that mortgage. Um, and she had had no idea that he was gambling. Um, and this was quite a difficult um, situation for her to grapple with because by this point he had passed. Um, there was a lot of complex emotional trauma. There was this sort of overlapping of grief and betrayal at the same time, as well as now all of these legal and financial difficulties. <laughs> um, so she was then facing bankruptcy and, and losing the family home. Um, there are some fairly complex and overlapping legal arguments because there are several lenders involved, several kind of touch points um, where there may arguably have been misconduct by those lenders. Um, and as I said, a significant volume of information to gather and, and financial analysis that needed to be done, um, which luckily was done by her financial counsellor, who she had a very um, good relationship with, um, who referred Nita to us, but was able to stay very closely involved. And um, we were able to run the matter um, sort of in conjunction with our lawyer and her financial counsellor working together. Um, the um, outcome of this whole matter is still pending. Um, so there is a complaint before the Australian Financial Complaints Authority. Um, it's a very complex matter and it's very difficult to find a resolution that is, um, uh, I guess, acceptable to both Nita and to the bank, which has um, an interest over the family home. There's a lot of emotions involved. Um, and the bank's position has always been that they're not responsible um, for these gambling losses because Nita's husband was free to use the offset account for any, the money in the offset account for any purpose, um, and that they had no responsibility to monitor that account for gambling transactions, um, which is a fairly standard position to take. Um, it also really highlights the importance of notifications to banks um, or other financial institutions to put them on notice of financial ab abuse, of separation, of gambling, um, because that's where some of that responsibility then changes and where the onus might shift. Um, so in terms of trying to resolve a matter or, or get compensation after the fact, um, the issue of notification will be really, really important. Um, so I think that case study highlights um, the importance of um, more interventions in this space and um, some of the recommendations from the um, Narrowly Hing article that I wanted to call out were um, firstly professional development for practitioners in domestic violence in gambling help and allied services to be able to screen for and respond to financial abuse um, and then a key point that we see in almost all of our work um, is needing better compliance with responsible lending obligations because if financial institutions are only providing credit products which are suitable and affordable, and they are taking those necessary steps to confirm identity, to inquire about someone's requirements and objectives in taking out a loan, um, checking the affordability of the loan, um, then that should be picking up on coercion, on duress, on financial abuse and gambling at the time of um, approving loans. Um, and then obviously, you know, some usual recommendations around displaying help numbers um, and referrals to financial counselling and domestic violence services, um, and then staff training and better policies um, in financial institutions, which is a large part of um, the work that we do. So as I mentioned earlier, we do um, a lot of capacity building work, both within the, the community sector, the general public industry and government. Um, we provide a lot of resources um, online on our website um, and kind of in the sector to help with that. And as Chris mentioned, we also coordinate the economic abuse reference group. So we work in collaboration with um, this national network of organisations um, to try and improve government and industry responses. 
Um, and a lot of our, our work involves making submissions um, to government, to inquiries, um, and you know, working to implement and improve um, policies and procedures in this space. So uh, just a few um, notes to leave you with if you're interested in finding out more, if you're interested in kind of upskilling or sharing any of these resources. We have a lot of webinars available on our website. Um, there's a bit of a list there. We've got an upcoming webinar on mortgage stress and financial abuse um, on the 3rd of May. Um, but many of these webinars are available um, for free. You can find the recordings and the slides. We have a lot of fact sheets that are designed for community workers and um, victim survivors, members of the public um, on a range of topics, um, which you can also find on our website. And if you do want to refer any clients to us or give us a call, um, we operate what we call a kind of phone a friend line for financial counsellors um, to help brainstorm strategy and issues and, and things like that. Um, and we also obviously take warm referrals um, all the time. So we've got a few contact methods up there. Um, and just a quick note that if you are working with someone who has experienced financial abuse, um, these are some of the referrals available for them. Um, we don't assist with elder financial abuse in our service. Um, we specialise in intimate partner violence. So um, there are services like Seniors Rights that will assist with that um, and, you know, always be mindful of um, any referrals that people you're working with might need um, in terms of domestic violence support or AVOs, victims' compensation, um, family law, as I mentioned. So that's it from me, and I will hand over to Chris. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Jasmine. Um, so I, it was a very interesting talk, and there was a few things that... Um, that really stood out to me that I, I guess I'd like to ask you about. And I'd just like to remind everyone, if you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box below and Jasmine and I will um, do our best to, to facilitate answering them. Um, so I guess what's the first question I'd like to ask you, because I am aware that a lot of our audience today um, are financial counsellors. And I guess what I'd like to know is how how do you guys and your team work with financial counsellors? Because it seems like there, there are some areas where you might be doing similar advocacy work, you might be, you know, making similar sort of um, requests on behalf of clients. So how, you know, when you are seeing a client who does have a financial counsellor, um, how, how would you work together? Great question. Um, the answer is very closely. It's actually our dream scenario to have a client who um, is already working with a financial counsellor. Um, we like to think of um, our service and our advice in that situation as being kind of a value add or almost like a specialist opinion. Um, so if a financial counsellor is already working with a client, we will always offer for them to attend appointments with the client. Um, often we'll be liaising with both and um, the client will attend the financial counsellor's office, um, particularly if they're somewhere in regional New South Wales, and then they'll dial us in together. Um, and in terms of how we kind of divide labour and, and provide wraparound support to the client, um, typically it will be the financial counsellor doing a bit more of that um, sort of legwork and, you know, the financial analysis, reviewing documents, um, gathering information and documents from the creditor um, and working with the client, trawling through all of their paperwork, which they can do much better face-to-face. -face. And then we'll be assessing that and providing some legal advice around potential avenues, around strategy, um, advising both the client and the financial counsellor um, around perhaps triaging some of the debts um, around the types of legal arguments that we think could be made in complaints to creditors, um, using our kind of knowledge and our expertise, advising whether we think certain arguments are more or less likely to be successful with particular creditors, um, or advising at what point it might be necessary to escalate the matter to um, AFCA, or whether in some cases there's actually merit in seeking um, a pro bono opinion from a barrister, for example, and contemplating um, potential court proceedings. So we're really providing that kind of extra layer of um, 
legal advice and strategy. Um, and often the financial counselor is able to say, oh, great, um, I'll go and, you know, write that up and prepare those arguments and I'll um, come back to you with an update. Or often we're actually ghost writing complaints um, and correspondence for the financial counselor to then send to the creditor, but they've got that um, ongoing kind of correspondence with the creditor and the ongoing relationship with the client. Okay. So it's sort of, yeah, so it's the financial counselor would maintain the ongoing relationship with both parties and you, your team would be sort of advising on, on the sort of where the law stands essentially. Exactly. And, and yeah. sometimes the financial counselor will say, look, I feel a bit out of my depth or I feel like this is getting a bit complex or I don't have capacity for this. Um, and we might actually then take the client on completely ourselves and we might represent the client, but give the financial counselor updates with the client's consent. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the financial counselor will actually keep some of the matters, which are more sort of straightforward financial hardship matters. Mm -hmm. And then they will refer a couple of really complex ones to us um, and we work that way. But um, I think the beauty of it is that we're often kind of building capacity with financial counselors um, at the same time. And often it's a teachable moment where they can then take the letters that we've drafted or the legal arguments and use those in other matters. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. All right, we're starting to get a few questions coming on. I might start with a question we have um, from Mark Davies, which also lines up with a question that I had sort of jotted down to ask. So um, he wrote with specific reference to the case example you shared, Nita's um, story. Um, so what Mark writes is, I understand that the bank's having no obligation to engage in the couple's offset account once when the account is in surplus, but when extending the credit within the offset account, should not both account holders be agreeable to the increase and I guess what I would add to that is a more general question which is um you know you mentioned that one of the key things with financial abuse is um you know forged documents forged loan documents forged credit card applications all these sorts of things um if something has been forged in someone's name um you know in a general um in a general sense what happens to the debt? Are other clients able to have that? If someone put something in your name without your permission, wouldn't it have been the onus on the banks or the credit institutions to check that? And does that, you know, I'm assuming it doesn't make the debt go away, but, you know, do you have any sort of recourse with when those sort of things happen? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, the easiest um, situation, easiest, they're not easy, but um, I would say that the best case scenario is that the signature has actually been forged um, because banks and financial institutions tend to recognise that more clearly as fraud, obviously, or um, financial abuse. Um, and it's not easy to resolve in the sense that um, these matters will often end up, um, depends. Sometimes the financial institution, once those arguments are made, um, will go and look at the signatures, they'll get their internal legal advice, and they will very quickly realise this is not a matter that they want to see on the front page of um, the newspaper or on a current affair. Um, and they will very quickly offer um, a reasonable settlement to kind of make it go away. And typically that would involve agreeing to waive the debt um, and release the, the person from responsibility for that debt. Mm -hmm. um, often those matters will end up needing to go to AFCA, for example, where there might be handwriting experts who are engaged. Um, and that will then depend on um, the kind of evidence of the handwriting expert as to whether it was a forgery or not. Um, the more complicated situation is when the signature has not been forged, but it has been signed under duress. Um, and that might be threats or, or act, threats of or actual harm. Um, but in most circumstances in financial abuse, it's through a pattern of coercive control and it might not even be overt threats of harm. It might be the victim survivor having learned to walk on eggshells and understanding what the likely consequences will be if they don't um, sign. And we hear clients all the time say, well, I might have signed it, I don't know. I have no recollection of this. I received no information or advice about it. Um, but it was a pattern of our relationship that he, he, to use gendered language, would put a document in front of me and tell me that I had to sign it because it was, you know, for the family, but that it wasn't a big deal and I didn't need to know what it was. Um, and it's quite difficult to um, help 
financial institutions understand the lived experience of, of a victim survivor and why they would sign a document in that situation. Um, in the case study example, the client um, wasn't aware that the mortgage had been refinanced and that additional equity had been accessed. Um, and after her husband's passing, she actually went to the bank she thought and believed the mortgage was with um, to ask them what the balance was and to try to get some information and proactively manage her finances now that she was on her own. And it was at that point that the bank told her it had actually been refinanced several years earlier. And she had signed the document, the, the refinancing paperwork, um, but with no understanding of what it was and what the consequences were. Um, so to answer the, the question from Mark, I think it was, um, yes, there does need to be consent um, from both account holders, but the level of coercion and control in financially abusive relationships means that that consent is often not actual consent. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to look a little bit deeper into what the circumstances were and often what the bank's involvement is. So whether they actually spoke separately to that account holder, mm -hmm. um, whether they um, were aware of any signs of financial abuse that they failed to act on. Again, that notification element is really important because if a bank has been notified or put on notice of abuse or of a separation, um, then they have um, a higher kind of level of expectation and, and um, sorry, a higher level of responsibility and involvement expected of them by the industry. Okay. So I guess in this case, because, you know, from what you've told us, Nita was not aware at all that any of this was going on. And it's likely that she signed these papers that her husband put in front of her, thinking that it was perhaps setting things up for when he passed yeah. or something of that nature, that, yeah, it's a little bit, it's a more of a gray area than if it was a straight out forgery. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, so we have another question. Um, so you mentioned before that often we get default judgments. Um, so can you def uh, contest a default judgment once it is made? You can. Um, the, the process is setting aside the default judgment. Mm -hmm. um, the difficulty with that is um, that it will depend on how long after the default judgment is made that um, you actually apply to have it set aside and what your reasoning is. Um, so there would need to be a fair, it's an application to the court um, to have the default judgment set aside and to kind of rewind to where you were one step earlier, which is with a statement of claim against you. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't remove the, the whole matter. It just kind of rewinds you so that you can then lodge a defense and defend the claim. And so the difficulty you often encounter is that someone might want to set aside the default judgment. Um, and even if they have a good reason for why they didn't file a defense within 28 days, which is one of the criteria, they might not actually have a good defense to the claim in the first place. Yeah. And so even if you get the judgment set aside, you have to then have a defense to lodge. Um, Oops, sorry, we just lost Jasmine there for a bit. Um, back in there. So, oh, just bear with us. Um, oh, sorry. Back again. <laughs> so essentially, so what you're saying is, you know, getting the judgment set aside is just one step. Then you have to defend um, whatever it is that um, was the issue in question. Exactly. And so if there's no good defence to the, the claim in the first place um, and it's more a case of financial hardship or, you know, personal circumstance, um, then there's perhaps not much point in trying to get the default judgment set aside, but rather dealing with, um, you know, negotiating directly with the creditor about mm -hmm. how that judgment might eventually be paid off. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you for answering that one. Um, so another question. A question that I had that also um, I think this definitely relates because I am um, to a client that one of my colleagues is currently seeing where the question mark isn't so much around the gambler being because I guess this comes back to what we were talking about before about things sometimes being a bit tricky to define is that um, you know most of the discussion we'd be having today is based on the assumption that the gambler is also the one that's perpetrating the financial abuse but sometimes you know it's it's possible that um, the the person who is gambling may also be the victim of the financial abuse. And 
one of the things that you mentioned in one of your examples of what could be seen as an example of financial abuse is taking control um, of finances of an individual. And that struck me because that's actually something that's quite common uh, when someone has a gambling problem, it's quite common for another family member, usually the partner, to take control over the finances, at least for a period. And one of my colleagues, um, uh, Caitlin, she um, had raised a case with me recently where she was concerned she was working with a partner of a gambler who had taken control over um, her, his partner's finances. That was part of a pattern of, um, of behaviour that was very sort of similar to sort of emotional abuse, such as following her, um, you know, tracking her phone, making sure he knew where he was, uh, where she was. Um, so I guess given that taking control is often a step that we see um, in the management of problem gambling, how, how could you see that that might interact with some of these ideas around financial abuse? That's a great question. And, and I think it highlights the, some of the, um, I guess, intricacies of this space. Um, and it's something that has been kind of front and center of a lot of the conversations around coercive control um, and the process to criminalize coercive control um, in New South Wales, which may well be followed by other states in Australia. Um, this idea that, you know, when you start pulling out particular behaviors, that many of those behaviors could actually be the behaviors of the victim survivor rather than the perpetrator in different situations. Um, and why the, the underlying element of everything we're talking about is a power imbalance and that kind of dynamic of power and control. Um, so I, I think it's really important to keep that in mind and recognize that this isn't a checklist, mm -hmm. um, that you don't just go down the list and say, yep, that behavior, that behavior. Um, but similarly, that a single behavior in and of itself won't necessarily constitute a financially abusive relationship. Um, when it comes to, um, I, I guess my thinking is, well, in that scenario, what are the consequences and where might this become relevant? So if, for example, um, the victim survivor were to um, make Oh, sorry, I should say, if in that case, the person who is using gambling, who has had their finances controlled and, and had um, some of that control kind of taken away from them, if they were to approach their financial institution, for example, and try to regain control of some of those finances, or if they were to um, make an allegation, um, you know, of, I suppose, misconduct or, or, you know, a financial institution facilitating that control, mm -hmm. um, I would expect the financial institution to then look a little bit deeper and say, okay, well, is this a kind of cut and dry case of financial abuse? Um, what is the motivation behind that control? Um, and what are the actual consequences? Has there been a financial loss? Um, or actually, has that financial control um, led to... Um, you know, this person actually not losing a significant portion of their assets to gambling. Um, and so a financial institution is always going to look at what the financial loss is. And if you're making a complaint, whether to them or to um, AFCA or, or elsewhere, the question will always be, well, what loss have you suffered? Mm -hmm. And what are you seeking to do to kind of compensate for that? And if there hasn't been a loss, then that conversation will stop fairly early on. Does that sort of make sense? I guess it's not so much yeah. thinking about the behaviours, but about what the consequence is, what the motivation and the intention is behind them and where that power dynamic sits. Yeah, definitely. And it, I guess it does, you know, a case like that does highlight that it's not always as as clear cut as mm. to, you know, um, you know, what prism we should be looking mm. at, you know, and it's, it's, you know, definitely with each of these cases, they have to be looked at in sort of a really... Um, um, nuanced sort of way. Absolutely. All right. Um, so a question from, um, from my colleague, Sophia. So she asked, many of our clients may not be aware that what is happening to them could be considered financial abuse. Um, can you give guidance on how to start this first conversation with a client? That's a great question. Um, I would suggest if you're interested in um, kind of a more detailed response on this, have a look at our website. We've got some webinars from 2020, 2021, um, that go through kind of from the very beginning 
identifying financial abuse, having that conversation with clients, starting to gather documents and information. Um, so that's a bit more of a deep dive. But the short answer is um, gently and very sensitively, I would say, um, and focusing on behaviours and um, the client's experience in terms of how those behaviours have made them feel rather than going through a checklist, rather than using labels. Um, we've had many clients um, come through our service who haven't been comfortable identifying as someone who has experienced financial abuse or any form of abuse. Mm -hmm. um, the client case study that I gave, um, you know, would never identify herself as, a, as someone who had experienced abuse because her relationship with her husband was happy and loving um, for his entire life. Um, and particularly when we're working with clients um, from First Nations communities or culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds um, using interpreters, um, we often avoid using language around financial abuse or domestic violence because people don't um, kind of, that doesn't resonate with people. Um, so my answer would be focus on gentle questions around the client's um, decision-making power in the relationship, um, their access to bank accounts, um, whether their partner knows any of their PIN numbers or their like net bank logins, um, whether their partner um, has sort of made demands of them for money, what their partner's response was likely to be if they said no to a request or a demand, um, whether they felt comfortable um, asking questions about finances in the relationship um, or, you know, using money, using the bank account, um, buying things, whether they needed kind of permission um, to do certain things, whether there was ever any scrutiny of their spending, all of those kind of gentle questions that focus on the behaviours rather than the labels um, are a good way of starting to have that conversation. Okay, fantastic. All right. Um... So the next question is um, a bit of a multi-part question we have from Monica. Um, so how will the notification suggestion, which I guess is was your suggestion that when there is a separation of, of notifying the banks, um, how would that suggestion work for banks if there is an offset account which has been drawn down on by a gambler without the knowledge of the other partner? Um, transactions may be indicative of gambling, um, but should the banks have a responsibility to make sure the account holder uses their money responsibly and or letting the other joint holder know, especially as this could escalate to violence in the relationship? Um, good question. So um, I guess the first part of that is how does the sort of notification system work um, or, you know, does the bank have a responsibility to make sure that account is used responsibly? The answer is, um, no, the bank doesn't have a responsibility to make sure that I'm not using my transaction account, for example, on gambling or whatever else, um, or the funds in my offset. But if there is a joint account holder who has notified the bank um, of their concerns, um, that then introduces a level of responsibility that can be referred back to um, later on. And we had a client... Um, fairly recently who had notified the bank of um, their experience of domestic and family violence, the bank, bank failed to act appropriately and put controls in place, um, including things like, um, you know, a, a kind of industry guideline. And this is um, very clear in the Australian Banking Association's industry guidelines on family violence and financial abuse. There is an expectation that in the case of joint accounts, if the financial institution or the bank is made aware of um, the presence of domestic violence, of financial abuse, gambling, for example, um, and there is a request to change the authority levels on the account so that it, transactions require two signatures, for example, if the bank fails to action that and there is financial loss as a consequence, that is the point where um, you may be able to seek compensation. So it will go back to that notification point. And in the, the case I just mentioned, um, we were actually successful at AFCA in getting the client nearly $20,000 worth of mm -hmm. compensation um, going back to the point where they notified the bank and the bank failed to act. Um, and in that case, we were also able to get the client $5,400 of 
compensation for non-financial loss, which is actually the, the maximum amount that AFCA can award um, for non-financial loss. So that's where the notification becomes important. Um, it all centres around the authority levels and access of the account, um, but we also can't expect banks to be mind readers. Um, and some of that will come down to evidence of calls that um, one borrower might have made to the bank or disclosures they might have made or um, suspicious activity and warning signs of abuse if they presented at the bank in person. Um, it, you know, it's a case by case basis, but that's where it becomes really critical. Um, I think the second part of the question was around safety. Yes. So um, that is, again, um, one of the difficulties in this situation. Um, there are, again, in those guidelines um, that the Australian Banking Association has put out, um, there, is, um, there are processes for banks to be sensitive and mindful of safety when working with co-borrowers um, if they are, again, on notice that there is a safety risk to one borrower. Um, there is no need for one borrower to get the other borrower's consent to apply for hardship, for example, on an account. Um, if one borrower contacts the bank to change the authority levels, then obviously the co-borrower will become aware of that. But that's where we would always recommend um, and we'll actually ensure that our clients um, are connected with the domestic violence service or even 1-800-RESPECT, that they do safety planning and that they have a safety plan in place before we contact the financial institution or before we ask for a change to the authorities on the account or anything that might pro provoke um, a retaliation from the partner. Okay. All right. So, so I guess taking it all of that together, the main take home message is you need to talk to your bank if you have some of these concerns, because, you know, and I guess this is a general principle, I guess we're looking at it from the framework of financial abuse, but if we look at it, more generally, of mm -hmm. course, people are free to spend the money that's in their bank on whatever they want. So, of course, unless the bank has a reason to sort of suspect there's something going on. And from what you're saying, from a legal perspective, if you want to sort of have a successful claim against the bank, then um, having that notification sort of gives you so much stronger evidence um, that either if it is going to a regulator or even probably, hopefully, before it even gets to that point, that you might have more success, more success in your claims. Absolutely. So early notification, notification in writing, um, actually requesting something of the bank um, rather than sort of saying, here's the situation. I mean, it, it should be up to the bank and banks that have appropriate policies in place and, and have trained their frontline staff appropriately should know what to do from that point. Um, but if you're able to approach the bank with a request, um, that makes it much easier to then refer back to that notification in writing and pinpoint any shortcomings in the bank's response from that point forward. Okay. And I guess here's a related question. As from Caitlin, as someone in a counselling role, what does our role look like in how to, in supporting these notifications to the bank? Like, what do these notifications look like? You know, is it a letter? Is it a phone call? Is it going with the client to the bank? What does it look like? So it could be any of the above. Um, I would always much prefer to see it in writing so that you don't then have to, um, you know, go back to what the frontline staff member might have noted down in their case, in their client management system. Um, you know, if it ends up at AFCA or in court, for example, um, there might be recordings of phone calls. So, you know, that's kind of the next best option, I suppose, but I would always much rather see it in writing, um, even just in an email or in a letter that's gone and, you know, been handed to a bank um, staff member. Um, in terms of your role in supporting someone, um, you can attend the bank in person with um, the client, but they will obviously need to provide consent and a third party authority to the bank if they want you to be involved in any conversations. Um, I think it's definitely worthwhile to make sure that the person you're supporting has, um, you know, a safety plan in place, has supports in place um, to kind of preemptively deal with any retaliation that that might provoke. Um, and just making sure that there is that notification in writing and that there is some kind of follow-up to check what's been done afterwards. Um, and 
you know, I've seen many cases where um, a victim survivor has proactively contacted the bank and asked for the authority level on their account to be changed. Um, and then when their partner has found out about it, they've coerced them to go back to the bank and change the authority level back. And I've seen cases where that went back and forth like 10 times. And in my view, that is prima facie fairly strong evidence of some level of coercion and control in the relationship if someone is attending a branch individually um, and expressing their wishes and their intentions about the account and then they're calling up later and saying oh, actually I've changed my mind and then going back without the partner and so all of that will come into play um, and can be used to um, highlight those warning signs that the bank should have been aware of. Okay all right thank you and I think yeah that's as a yeah so get something in in writing I guess is the the key take home from that message. Yeah. All right um so Another question. Um, I guess this, this is from Ian, who's one of our financial counselors as well. And he's asked a question, which I guess is a bit of a tricky one. Um, should a problem gambler seek legal advice before giving over financial control to a partner? And, and why I say that's a tricky one is because that is something, that, as I said before, is something that's relatively common. It's something that often partners request when they're, when a, you know, one partner confesses that they've been gambling, often giving away financial control is something that um, that is requested. Um, I would suggest from my clinical experience, most of the time that's done relatively informally. So it's not, you know, set up in a legal way, but it's more that um, one partner is given visibility over accounts, you know, to ensure the other person's not gambling or they go, instead of going into a joint account, it goes to um, the other partner's account. Mm -hmm. But you know, what would be your advice in terms of that? Do, do you need sort of, would you suggest someone getting legal advice before doing something like that? Or do you feel, yeah, how do you feel about that? Um, I I don't really have a, a problem with that idea at all. I think, um, I guess the question is where that person would be able to get legal advice um, from as kind of a first point, because um, it doesn't kind of, neatly fall within um you know it's sort of more financial planning advice I guess in a way um, than kind of squarely squarely legal advice um, but I think it's certainly a good idea to think about what that handing over or relinquishing some financial control might look like um, and I think having joint authorities on an account for example so rather than completely handing over all control and visibility to someone else um, requiring both signatures on transactions for an offset account, for example, so that um, that requires a conversation between both account holders mm -hmm. rather than one person acting unilaterally. Um, I think that's certainly a good idea. Um, in terms of those other examples you gave, um, I think provided the person still has some level of visibility over the account, but perhaps not the ability to unilaterally transact on the account, um, that will make it much easier if that situation does kind of devolve into a financially abusive situation. Mm -hmm. um, that does make it much easier for the person who is gambling and has relinquished control to kind of immediately take that to a lawyer or a financial counsellor, for example, and get some advice. Um, I think the, the thing that concerns me the most is losing visibility over accounts and over transactions and over financial affairs. Um, because that's what we see most commonly in our practice. And that's where we then have to go through this journey of information gathering and, and untangling everything. And that gets quite complex. Okay. And I think what you sort of said there ties in with the, the advice that I always, I always give to clients is that um, in essence, especially when we're talking about gambling, sometimes mm -hmm. visibility is the more important thing than control. So it's, it's sort of important that both parties have visibility over joint finances rather than sort of one partner then takes control and it goes into this mm. black box or vice versa. So I think what you sort of, yeah, and they are different things, control and mm. visibility. And I think, you know, what you're from what you're saying there is that a lot of financial abuse, um, you know, thrives in that, that lack of visibility. So that's probably, you know, the important aspect to consider there. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, but speaking of legal advice, that does come to a question that um, that Steve, another one of our financial counsellors, had asked, which I guess is more of a practical type one, um, which is um, for your service um, at, at Redford Legal Centre. Um, 
uh, through this financial abuse service if, um, you know, these sort of matters go to court, um, there's good prospect for a client, um, how far will, how far do you, would you take a case on a pro bono basis? Like, is it, see it through or is there limits or? Um, so our, all of our services are completely um, free. We obviously have a very high level of demand and limited capacity. Um, so we will, um, before taking a matter on and representing the client, we will obviously consider um, prospects, prospects of success, whether the client is eligible for support elsewhere, for example, from legal aid, which only caters to sort of bottom 8%, I guess, of, um, of the population in terms of um, economic resources. Um, so we will consider whether there is another avenue for the person to get representation um, and what the prospects of success are and how far it's likely to go. Um, the vast majority of our matters end up settling um, at AFCA, if not before then. Mm -hmm. um, but if they're unable to settle through external dispute resolution mechanisms and we have um, you know, strong prospects of success, that's where we will likely engage and brief a pro bono um, barrister. So we'll get counsel on a pro bono basis. Um, and that obviously depends on our ability to find counsel prepared to take it on. Um, but we've had matters in the past that ended up settling before this point, but we had um, counsel who were prepared to act pro bono in the Supreme Court. Um, so it's a case by case basis. Um, often court proceedings aren't necessary, um, particularly when we're up against financial institutions, they tend to be um, quite commercial in their decision making and they'll reach a point where they just want to settle and, and not have to deal with um, either having a final determination made against them at AFCA because it will be public mm -hmm. um, or going through court um, where we tend to be involved in court litigation for a much longer period of time is our family law matters which tend to move at a snail's pace um, rather than having a financial institution on the other side you have a per perpetrator of abuse mm -hmm. um, who's often using you know, systems abuse and using the court system to continue to perpetrate um, and those family court matters will often continue for years. Okay, so it it's one of those, it depends, I guess, sort of answers to that question. But, yeah. um, but it, you know, I guess as a general principle, you're not going to leave someone high and dry halfway through a matter no, or anything. No, like exactly. And we'll always be very clear um, what the scope of our assistance is. So if we, um, we might say, look, we'll represent you um, all the way through to the end of the AFCA process. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't settle, um, you will then have a decision to make about whether you want to go to court. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, we'll have to assess our capacity and resources um, as to whether we're able to continue representing you or whether we need to refer you to a private solicitor, for example, or try to find pro bono representation. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have very strong partnerships with um, corporate firms mm -hmm. and we have a very good success rate of being able to place more complex matters or more time consuming matters um, with um, pro bono teams at corporate firms. OK. All right. Thank you for that. And yeah, so I guess um, take home message is, um, you know, you're you're there to support people. And if you can't support people directly yourselves, you as a service will look. To we'll find someone who can. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we have a question from Julian, who is one of our um, multicultural gambling specialists. And he asks um, an example where um both partners in a couple are Chinese migrants and not familiar with the law in New South Wales. The husband is a gambler and only pays rent, but no other financial contrib contributions to the family with the rest of the money going, going to his gambling. Um, the wife also works and wants him to stop gambling. Otherwise, she is threatening to leave the relationship. But the husband threatens not to divorce him. Otherwise, um, she would lose 50% of her estate to him, according to the law. Is it true about this? 50-50 financial arrangement in divorce in New South Wales. Um, and the reason why in particular is she's just received um, a large inheritance from her father um, in China, and she's worried that if she divorces her husband, he's going to get half of that. So the short answer is this client needs legal advice from a family lawyer very quickly. Um, the second short answer is no, that statement around a 50-50 split is not correct. Um, a, a huge disclaimer that I'm not, as I said, a family lawyer, um, but there is a um, an assessment process that is undertaken um, in family law to determine 
what is a fair and equitable um, split of assets of the relationship. Um, and that will depend on things like um, the relative financial contributions that each party brought into the relationship, um, the relative financial contributions they made during the relationship. For example, if one person had much more, um, you know, financial support from their family coming in, um, the non-financial contributions of each party, so child rearing, um, you know, things like that, um, the future needs of the parties in terms of their ability to work, their financial assets, um, who is going to have custody of any children, um, all of those things. Um, and there will then be an assessment of what, whether it's appropriate to sort of adjust the split that each person gets and what that split might look like. So there is a very big, um, there's a lot of considerations. It's a very big process in working out what should happen. Um, the 50-50 split is a bit of a um, myth, I would say. Um, and we often see that being used um, as a kind of threat piece in relationships, um, particularly in separation and particularly where people aren't um, aware of what the legal situation is. So I would suggest that that um, client needs to get family law advice very quickly so that they can understand, so that she can understand what her rights are at law um, and then make an informed decision about, you know, the separation, about um, the future of the relationship and her financial affairs. Yeah, I think that that 50-50 split um, myth, I think it, you know, it's something that, you know, works well in the movies and things like that. And maybe it applies in some states in America, but yeah, it definitely is not the way how divorce settlements yeah. work in, in New South Wales. So um, yeah, so I think, yeah, so the main, I guess, advice is get legal, specific legal advice in that circumstance. Yes, definitely. So, all right. Um, so another question, this one from uh, Anonymous question, but I think this one is where we start to get into um, questions about guardianship, which is a different, I guess, another complicating factor as well, which is, um, you know, when one partner has a cognitive impairment, um, can that be a defense or reason for another partner to take control? And does that complicate things, I guess, as well? The answer is it does complicate things. Um, again, as we're kind of delving into guardianship, I would suggest that's um, a better question for um, the Intellectual Disability Rights Service, um, mm -hmm. who are kind of the specialists in this area, um, and also potentially for the trustee and guardian. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So it's um. So yes, it definitely is an element, but um. Yeah. Probably something. You know. And we are hopefully looking to get um, someone to talk to us about guardianship later in the year. So that might be a, a more appropriate question for when, when we get to that. Definitely. I think it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to ever um, kind of talk about, uh, we use the language of defences to financial control um, because it is a very murky area and, um, yeah, it requires consideration of a whole lot of factors, including you know, the, the person's level of capacity, um, whether that financial control is actually formalised in the form of a guardianship order and what that all mm -hmm. looks like. Um, so, yeah, definitely a question for a specialist. Yeah. Okay. All right. So another question from Anne, who's another um, financial counsellor, and she's asked, um, some clients where there's financial abuse involved have no idea um, that a bank might be involved with a property. Um, she's recently had a client with three properties and the only way they could establish that there was a relationship with the lender was to do a property search to ascertain who held the mortgages. Um, and I guess this also comes back to another question that we also got, which is, um, comes back to, you know, there's a lot of secrecy around financial abuse sometimes. And that, you know, with Nita's story in particular, um, you know, she had obviously no idea that she was a victim of financial abuse until it was um, too late. So, um, are there, are there ways for people to, you know, stay on top of things? Are there, you know, I know with a lot of the um, recent data hacks and things like that, people are encouraged to have alerts set for their, um, for their credit scores and whatnot. Um, you know, what sort of things can people do to sort of help protect them against financial abuse? So the starting position is um, basically credit reports. That's the most logical and easiest place to find out. Um, whether there are lines of credit in your name currently, whether there have been applications, whether successful or unsuccessful, 
the lines of credit because they will appear as inquiries on your credit report. Um, so that's the first step is going directly to the three credit reporting bureaus in Australia. So Equifax, Ilion and Experian. Um, some people will go to third party kind of aggregators or um, other services that charge money or that only kind of use data from one or two of them. Um, the most co comprehensive route is to go directly to all three of them. You can request your credit report for free every three months um, without having to pay anything. Um, and different institutions report to different credit reporting bodies, um, frustratingly. So I always advise to check all three. Um, and that will then reveal whether there are current accounts, so mortgages, um, credit cards, personal loans um, in your name, whether there are default judgments against you, um, whether there have been credit inquiries that you're not aware of. Um, the suggestion around the title searches is obviously the next step, or I guess the first step if there are um, properties that the person is aware of but doesn't know whether they're actually on title. Um, you can also do um, personal name searches through um, different sort of aggregators um, through asset company records to see if someone is the director or has been the director of any companies, um, which is an important step to take if there are kind of small businesses involved or directorships. Um, and then taking all of those bits of information and then making the inquiries. So, you know, looking at what's on the credit report, reaching out to those financial institutions to gather information, matching up mortgages with title searches. Um, it is a process. Um, it's a process that we go through very frequently um, because often clients come to us and say, I know we, you know, we've just separated. I know we have a bunch of investment properties and a bunch of mortgages, and I have no idea whether I'm on any or all of them um, or whose name the property is in. And that step is really critical for family law proceedings because it might be that someone is a joint borrower on a mortgage, and so they're jointly and severally liable for that whole mortgage, but they're not actually on the title of the property. Um, and that's really concerning. And that's where they might need urgent family law advice um, to get an injunction to stop that property being sold um, or lodge a caveat um, on that property. So all of those steps need to happen, um, preferably as soon as possible, but the credit reports are the best starting point. Okay. And I, I think, I, you know, I'm learning something here today because I didn't, I didn't realise that, you know, the three different reporters had different amounts of different types of information available. So um, I think that's good advice to mm. make sure to check all three because, you know, there might be something hidden that you're missing. Exactly. And particularly with um, all of the recent privacy breaches, um, you can contact those credit reporting bodies and request a freeze on your credit report. Um, we only advise that if someone isn't looking to take out a line of credit in the near future. Mm. Um, it makes it then very difficult if you want to change your utility provider or take out a new phone plan or... Um, open a new credit card account, that will just be knocked back. Um, but if you're not planning on taking out any lines of credit, um, you can ask them to put a block on your um, credit report, which will prevent identity theft by way of these data breaches, but mm -hmm. it will also prevent identity theft by an intimate partner who knows your personal details and your 100 points of ID mm -hmm. and could go and open accounts and lines of credit in your name. Yeah. And I think, yeah, Alona, one of our gambling counsellors, she's um, made that exact point that you made there about you'll be able to put a freeze on your yeah. credit report if you're concerned about, about these sorts of things. Yeah. So, um, all right. So we might have to add it there. I'm sure we could be talking all day today about this topic. And I know, I know I've definitely found it um really useful today and I'm sure that a lot of the attendees have found it really useful um so as I said earlier this uh has been um filmed so we will be um putting it on our our website if you do want to share it with your colleagues who weren't able to make it today but I'd like to say a big thank you to Jasmine um as you're still happy to share the slides that have I guess all the contact details um because I'm pretty sure that there'll be quite a few joint clients between us as gambling counsellors and gambling financial counsellors and, and your service. So, um, yeah, so, and it sounds like there's already a few clients that we've spoken about today that may, may end up on, on your, on your books at some point. So, um, yeah, hope so. yeah, so thank you again for today's talk. Um, and just to share with everyone, um, 
So um, we are looking to put in a schedule for journal clubs moving forward for the rest of the year and early next year. Um, hopefully we're going to have a combination of ones that are a webinar format like we have today, um, as well as some that will be held in person at Sydney University. I know for some of you who are based in rural and regional areas, getting to the uni is a little bit tricky, but I know for some of you who are based in Sydney, you like um, the face-to-face -face contact. So we want to have a bit of a mix of things going forward. Um, and as I intimated earlier, one of the, the topics that we've already highlighted is going to be guardianship, um, hopefully later in the year. So if you do think of any other ideas for topics, please contact me um, or any of our team so that we can um, try and put a schedule together that's going to be really interesting for everyone. Um, but yeah, just a final thanks to everyone for attending and thanks again for Jasmine and um, enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me.